Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is good that we've come and gathered together on this Good Friday. And I welcome you to this, our joint service of Presbyterian churches and pastors here in Fort Mill. This service has become an important witness as we gather together on this particular day. In the service today, we will seek to enter this scriptural story. You will hear scriptures read from the chancel and from behind in a dramatic way. As we listen and reflect, I ask you to pray that you might allow this account of God's love to speak a powerful word to you today. At the end of the service, we will depart in silence. If you would like to participate in prayer stations to continue your reflections on this day, and in particular the traditional seven last words of Christ, I'll ask you to exit through this door here from the sanctuary and then make your way down the hall where you might begin those stations together. All are invited to participate in the seventh and final station, which will be located outside the doors of the narthex where you will have something to take with you today. As we've come and as we've gathered, we've come to worship. So I invite you to stand as you are able that we might call ourselves to worship using the words found in your bulletin. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will face the betrayal and denial. God is not only God also in sorrow, we will witness the horror and heartbreak. This too is the day that the Lord has made. We will tell of God's deliverance. Let us pray. We come, O Lord, to gather near the cross, disturbed, distraught, discouraged. Yet we gather here as disciples, those whom Jesus loves. On this day of great solemnity, let us stand as witnesses to your great love for all the world, revealed in the outstretched arms of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
when they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all fall away, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Look, my betrayer is at hand.
Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him then laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a rebel? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. They took Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying... We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son, the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You've heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! The guards also took him and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the female servants of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You, you also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I don't know or understand what you're talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. And the female servant, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But then after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean, and you look like one, and you talk like one. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I don't know this man you are talking about. At that moment, The cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept.
As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in the prison with the insurrect who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want to, for me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have them release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish for me to do with the man you call king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed and spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. Let us pray. O holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Here at Unity, we have been spending the season of Lent with Jesus in Jerusalem in the Gospel of Mark. Each week we have slowed down to experience the days of Holy Week. Like the readings we are hearing in this service, we are a part of this story. We have followed Jesus as he cursed the fig tree and turned over tables in the temple. We have listened as he continued to teach and preach. We have sat down at tables with him where he was anointed with expensive nard and the table where he was betrayed by a close friend. We fell asleep in the garden waiting for Jesus to finish praying we stood in the courtyard of his unjust trial, keeping silent, not knowing what to say. And now we find ourselves here, at the foot of the cross, the day of Christ's crucifixion. Every year on this day, as I stand at the foot of the cross once again, 
I think about Christmas. Now, I don't mean the most wonderful time of the year or the holly jolly Christmas. I mean the incarnation, the word made flesh, the light that the darkness could never comprehend. That Christmas, the gift of God with us, Emmanuel. As much as I have tried to understand our triune God and all of their mysterious ways, I can never wrap my mind around the kind of love it takes for God to come and be with us. And more than just being with us, becoming us, taking on flesh in all of our human messiness. As the message translation says in John 1:14. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Jesus moved in with us, and he didn't look for the nicest house to stay in with the highest thread count sheets or the best water pressure. Jesus moved in with us in our pain and our suffering and our brokenness. Jesus could have lived a different life. He could have taken the easy way out. He could have lived a quiet life that didn't challenge the authority and those in power. But instead, Jesus chose to love us. He could have avoided sitting down at tables with sinners and tax collectors. He could have followed the rules, but he chose to eat with them. He could have ignored the once hemorrhaging woman in the crowd that day as she crawled on her hands and knees to just touch the hem of his cloak. But he saw her and acknowledged her incredible faith. Jesus could have ended his ministry when he was rejected in his own hometown in Nazareth, but he chose to continue. He could have left the blinded without sight, the hungry without food, the sick without healing, and the lonely all by themselves. But he didn't. He continued to heal and feed and to be present. Even as those choices led Jesus to the last week of his life here in Jerusalem, where he was betrayed, arrested, tortured, and hung on a cross. Jesus continued to love. At any point this week, Jesus could have chosen to walk away to save himself. As he prayed in the garden, he asked for that very thing, to let this cup pass from him if there was another way, any other way. Please, God, can we try that one? But there was no other way. Love is the way. Every single moment from Jesus' birth in Bethlehem to each encounter with every person in his life to this very moment on the cross, Jesus continued to love us, knowing the kind of power that that kind of love would have. The kind of love that's not only willing to move into the neighborhood with us, but willing to be with us in the deepest places of suffering we experience. The kind of love that keeps the Son of God on the cross to die for sinners. The kind of love that defeats even the cruelest, most traumatic deaths the human body can suffer. The kind of love that raises dead to new life. That kind of love transforms the world. This is why we can think back to the incarnation today on Good Friday here at the crucifixion, because we cannot have one without the other. Theologian Kasuki Koyama says this, the incarnate Lord is the crucified Lord. The crucified Lord is the risen Lord. There is only one Jesus Christ, our Lord. No one can isolate the incarnation from crucifixion, crucifixion from resurrection. Crucifixion does not make sense apart from the incarnation, the resurrection apart from the crucifixion. Crucifixion is the ultimate depth of the incarnation. 
Friends, here at the foot of the cross, as Jesus is crucified, we are shown the incredible depth of God's love for us. The kind of love that allows God's own self to be nailed to the cross is the same love that is present in the deep suffering of our world. It's the love that lays on the ground holding a starving child while she sleeps in the corner of a hospital in Gaza. And it's the love who every day looks at the photo of a kidnapped family member in Jerusalem. It's the love that drowns in the river at the southern border with the migrants trying to cross treacherous waters to safety. And it's that same love that steps back into the river with the border guards who experience the trauma of recovering their bodies. It's the love that suffers violence at the hands of gang members in Haiti. It's the love that feels every bullet strike in every mass shooting. It's the love that knows the fear and grief when we hear the word cancer. It's the love that endures the first week of sobriety in rehab. It's the love that meets us in the pain of all of our broken relationships. This is the love of Christ on the cross. Mark leads us here today in excruciating detail, only to make us stop and stay here in the simplicity of four words, and they crucified him. We are here at the foot of the cross, witnessing the depth of the incarnation, God with us. How do you feel as you are here? Can you comprehend the kind of love that brought us here? The kind of love that won't leave us here? It's the love of Christ that will never, ever let us go. The love it takes for the incarnation and for the crucifixion, the love that meets us in the most unbearable moments of our lives, is the love that has the power to transform death into new life. This love saves us, as only God can do. Author Diana Butler Bass says this, ultimately the cross remakes the world. It takes nouns that have been corrupted and turns them into verbs for the sake of new creation. Forgiveness is possible. Courage is possible, compassion is possible, transformation is possible, justice is possible. The cross is the place where our lives are upended by forgiveness, courage, compassion, transformation, and justice. Siblings, as we stand at the foot of the cross today, may we recognize the incredible love that brought us here. May we acknowledge the deep suffering of Christ as well as our neighbors in this world. May we hope in the new life and transformation that will occur between now and when the sun rises on Easter morning. And like the incarnate Son of God, Jesus Christ, may we choose love each moment of every day in each encounter we have. May it be so. Amen.
It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two rebels, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. And in the same way, the chief priest, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son.
There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and the younger, James the younger and of Joseph and Salome, who followed him when he was in Galilee and ministered to him. And there were many other women who had come up with him from Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph brought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where the body was laid. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what have I done to you? In what have I offended you? Answer me. I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, have mercy upon us. I led you through the desert 40 years and fed you with manna. I brought you through tribulation and penance and gave you my body, the bread of heaven, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, have mercy upon us. What more could I have done for you that I have not done? I planted you, my chosen and fairest vineyard, and made you the branches of my vine. But when I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar to drink and pierced with a spear the side of your Savior, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, Lord have mercy upon us. I went before you in a pillar of cloud, and you have led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I scourged your enemies, brought you to a land of freedom, but you have scourged, mocked, and beaten me. I gave you the water of salvation from the rock, but you have given me gall and left me to thirst, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, have mercy upon us. I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the keys to the kingdom, but you have given me a crown of thorns. I raised you on high with great power, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, have mercy upon us. My peace I gave, which the world cannot give, and washed your feet as a sign of my love. But you draw the sword to strike in my name and seek high places in my kingdom. I offered you my body and blood, but you scatter and deny and abandon me and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, have mercy upon us. I sent the spirit of truth to guide you, and you close your hearts to the counselor. I pray that all may be one in the Father and me, but you continue to quarrel and divide. I call you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, Lord, have, have mercy, mercy upon us. us. I grafted you into the tree of my chosen Israel, and you turned on them with persecution and mass murder. I made you join heirs with them of my covenants, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, Lord have, have mercy, mercy upon us. 
I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, Lord, have have mercy mercy upon upon us.
As a reminder, if you would like to continue the service by experience, experiencing the prayer stations that follow the seven last words of Christ, you can do so following out this door on your left. Now, as our time of worship draws to a close and we go out from this place, may we linger today at the foot of the cross where we know the deep love of the incarnation in its fullness. And as you go from this place, may peace and nothing less find you along the way. May you be blessed and may you be a blessing. And may light, love's own crucified, resurrected light, guide you and countless others all the way home. Amen. <laughs>